if people will still be filtering in. Um, thank you all for coming in the middle of what I know is an incredibly busy week um, here at IU and everywhere. Um, I wanted to especially thank the Russian East European Institute and Sarah Phillips for organizing this um, and thank Claire Franks for herding us all into a group and finding a day that worked for everyone. It was quite a feat. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Slavic department here at IU also. And of course our panelists for joining us and for agreeing to share what I think will be both personal and scholarly responses to the life and works of Yuri Ritkeu. So what I'll do is um, oh, first mention that this will be recorded so that everyone knows um, and can be used for posterity. And I'll introduce the speakers, all of them now, so that we aren't interrupted during the panel. Um, they'll each speak for about 15 minutes, and then we hope to have 15 or 20 minutes um, for questions. Oh, and by the way, I am Elizabeth Jabal, um, a professor of Russian literature and culture at Indiana University. So our first speaker will be Ilona Chavas who was born in Belarus, but then together with her family emigrated to the United States in 1989. She has translated numerous novels, including three by Yuri Rikkeu, the most recent of which was When the Whales Leave. Um, but she has also translated Galina Sherbakova's short stories for the Daedalus anthology, Slav Sisters, and has forthcoming novels, um, one called Russian Gothic by Alexander Skorobogatov, and The Village at the Edge of Noon by Daria Babiliova. She's also the co-translator of Elena Kostuchenko's fearless book of reportage, I Love Russia, Reporting from a Lost Country, which is going to be soon be published by Penguin Press. Um, and she now lives in London with a day job in publishing and a, I guess a night job in translating. <laughs> so she will be our first speaker. Um, our second speaker is Auden Melk, uh, from the University of Oslo, where he's an associate professor of Russian literature. His PhD thesis was on the anti-utopian theme in Platonov's Chevin Gur and Dostoevsky's The Possessed. And he's written numerous articles on both 19th century writers like Gogol, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy, but also 20th century writers um, such as Bulgakov and Platonov. His main theoretical interest is Bakhtin and the concept of the chronotope, which he uses in many of his literary analyses. But in recent years, his attention has turned to indigenous Russian literature and especially the Chukchi writer, Yuri Kritkeu. And finally, we'll have Russell Valentino, who is professor and chair of the Department of Slavic and East European Languages at Indiana University, where he teaches courses on Russian culture, translation, literary and cultural history. Um, he has also translated a number of novels, the most recent of which is um, Bosnian author Milenka Yergovic's Kin, which was published by Archipelago Press in 2021. And he has an essay coming out in the Massachusetts Review this summer called Loving Russia. So if anyone has more questions for the speakers, uh, those can come after the panel, but I'll turn it over to Ilona, our first panelist to begin. Uh, I won't, unless you particularly want me to, rehearse Yuri's sort of biography, um, except to say that he was born in 1930, which was an interesting time in Chukotka, where the Soviets were already in power, but not entirely in power. And his grandfather was the last shaman of, um, of Uelen, which is a kind of extraordinary place on, it's an extraordinary village on a sandy kind of spit with both sides of the spit facing water. The geography is, is, is just kind of out of this world. I kept having to look at the map when I was translating his books because it's so hard to imagine uh, the place without looking 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 at it on a, on a kind of flat map. Uh, his grandfather was named Mletkin, which means at the crux of time because his grandfather had a premonition that his grandson would stand between sort of two eras, the past and the future, and the present sort of didn't really exist. And I've always found that really, and I think Alden probably will talk about time um, uh, in his in his um, kind of bit of the talk. I like to tell this anecdote about Yuri because I think it's sort of funny and enlightening. When I only met him once 
uh, in real life. I spoke to him on the phone quite quite a few times, but we launched the first book that we did together, which was A Dream in Polar Fog um, in Las Vegas. And I've worked in publishing for almost 20 years. I've never ever come across a book launch where the place of the book launch and the setting of the book were so conceptually at odds with one another. Um, but the book was supported by a grant by a foundation that was running at the time. And the man who mm. sort of funded the foundation was a kind of um, Las Vegas magnate who either owned or ran uh, the Mandalay Bay Casino in Vegas. So he said, why don't you have the launch here? And I'll fly the translator and the author out to Vegas and we'll have dinner and we'll launch the book. Um, I think it's the only time in my translation career, past, present or future, <laughs> where I get to stay in a really nice uh, hotel room because I translated a book. That kind of doesn't, <laughs> doesn't happen. Um, and we went, we went to dinner. It was, and, and you know, Las Vegas is a crazy place to launch a book about vodka. Um, but we went to dinner and Yuri was telling all kinds of anecdotes. And one of the things that sort of made everyone really laugh, he was talking about the first time he left Chukotka with a friend to go to university and they were traveling up to sort of Moscow and they had a really long journey and a few days out they had a kind of stopover where they could they had a day to go and explore a small town and they went to the market there and in the market they saw all these foods that they had only seen in a textbook you know in a vocabulary book uh and they didn't have a lot of money and they were trying very hard to think of what would be the best thing to buy that was the best value for money and a lot of the fruit uh they had never seen before except in a book and didn't really know how to eat because fruit doesn't really grow in Chukotka uh <laughs> vegetables don't really grow there either nothing particularly green except moss grows there or, or seaweed um and they were walking around this market uh looking at all these things and the one thing that they they really were familiar with was berries but the berries were really expensive uh, and they couldn't they couldn't face spending all their money on a punnet of berries until they found a gigantic berry that didn't cost the earth. And, you know, they thought, well, this is what we have to this is what we're going to buy. And at this point, Yuri paused and sort of, you know, twinkled and said, and that's how I bought my first watermelon. <laughs> um, and everyone and everyone laughed. And, you know, and, that's, and then the story went on that they went to the pier and took out their knives and sliced a little bit off this watermelon and chewed it and it was sort of you know kind of tasted like vegetable but wasn't particularly nice and they thought well okay you know and then they and then they broke it apart and inside it was sort of slimy and pink and you know it, it looked really strange and 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 Yuri said to his friend you know what we don't want to get food poisoning and not end up going to university on time discretion is the better part of valor let's let's just leave it and they threw it off the riverbank into the river because they didn't they didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I like this anecdote not so much because it's you know it's funny because they didn't know what the what the watermelon was, but because in all of his works and in a lot of the other indigenous works that I've read, there is this really wonderful sense of practicality and mm. and kind of reasoning out of things and and for books that are and, and stories and myths and kind of an oral culture which on the one hand is very very mystical um you know and has people trance walking and ancestors communicating and you know deer flying through the air it's also really really unsentimental the daily life is very unsentimental everything is very practical there's no huge heroism um it's all small daily things and this idea of kind of what what are we going to buy that'll be the best value for money? Let's find the biggest berry that we could find. Always kind of, to me, suggests this this real canniness that they brought with them to the big to the big city, and this ability to take stock of what's happening. One of the things that's very prevalent in Yuri's work and in a lot of other certainly northern indigenous works is a setting out almost immediately of the weather conditions. You know, what was the weather like? What was the sun like? What season was it? You know, how close were we to the equinox? The the conditions of travel, who was with us? All of these kind of factual things are kind of embedded in these in these texts. Because when you're living cheek by jowl with not that many people, everything everything kind of matters. And 
another thing that always strikes me in his novels is that people don't speak a lot, but they watch each other. People notice things without being told. Uh, strangers don't notice things. You know, children have to learn to notice things without being told, to see how people feel. No one talks about their feelings, really, but you're expected to kind of take stock constantly of what's going on around you. Um, and that is probably a function of the geography, which is so incredibly inhospitable. If you space out, you die. It's as simple as that. And then on a kind of you know psychological plane, that also very strikingly comes across. There's an awful lot of looking and thinking about people. People think about other people. What might they want? What are they? What are they about? No one really explains what they're feeling uh, to anyone else. And everything is very practical and very logical. So, um, yeah, I like, I really love that story with the watermelon. And then the other story I like to tell is a translation story, uh, which is his uh, A Dream in Color Fog was the first book of Yuri's that I translated. It was also the first book that I ever translated. And like every translator, I can't really read it without cringing, um, you know, because I'd like to go back and change a whole bunch of things. And I was quite nervous and I phoned him a few times. He was in St. Petersburg and I was in London and the time difference, I think is about five hours. And he was an early riser. So I would get up at sort of 4am in the dark and wrap myself in a blanket and get a calling card. because This was maybe 2004. Um, there was no Zoom and, and phone him and ask him questions. And once I, I said to him, Yuri, you know, there's this passage, which I just, I don't get you know, three people get into the boat and they go to the sacred island of the dead and then, then four people get out and then they pray and then they do this and this. And then three people get into the boat and then they come out on the other side and it's four people again. Is it a metaphor? And he laughed and he said, God, you know, you know, he said, you know, I think I wrote this bit in the 70s with my left hind foot, you know, just make it, make it as many people as it needs to be. The number of people doesn't matter. My editor was asleep at the wheel just just and he and he said and he said he kind of gave me this sort of like half blessing half challenge I remember he said just make it sing it doesn't matter you know how faithful you are whatever that means it sings and it has a rhythm make it sing in English and if you have to change the numbers of the people who got into the boat it's the <laughs> material change it so he was very unprecious about his work actually um, and again, that practicality, I said, what's your hope for this? And he said, I hope it sells lots of copies and I make lots of money. And and that kind of was him in a nutshell. He was, you know, he was really, really, uh, he was really down to earth. And uh, after that Vegas weekend, um, he died about about a year later. So I never got to, I never got to um, see him again. But I went on to translate two of his, two more of his books the last of which is a novella, a very, very beautiful novella called When the Whales Leave, uh, mm. which as I worked on it, I think I approached it at first. I thought it was a bit of, you know, a small, a small extra thing. And it, and it, as I worked on it, it became my favorite actually of his, mm. of his books because it's very, very simple and has incredible economy and in it, I think he wasn't bound the way he was in the 70s by censorship and by having to, you know, he was a kind of pet writer of the Soviets. He didn't really stick his neck out. He didn't protest. You know, he was kind of in the in the establishment and as far as he could be. And I think When the Whales Leave was a book sort of out of that canon in some ways because he's talking about such deep time and it's all sort of mythical and legendary. He didn't have to put anything political in it. Uh, and it's a very, very cohesive, very beautiful, very lyrical piece of work. And it really sings. It really sings in Russian. I hope it really sings in English as well. And uh, yeah, someone asked me, um, an interviewer asked me a few years ago, how come only three books of his have been translated? And I had to laugh and say three books by a dead author in 15 years. That's that's actually a lot. That's for for English language publishing. That's a pretty good that's a pretty good record. And I hope that there are more books uh, to do. I hope that I hope I get to work on on another of his books. He's a really interesting writer, deceptively simple, the way that a lot of the indigenous writers are, but with awful economy and with a lot to say in very plain, often prose, in very compact timelines. Um, 
And again, that harkens back perhaps to me of people not having in his books long drawn out conversations. You know, people will say a few words and everyone else understands, you know, that there's nothing else to say. And uh, and I really, I'm really fond of his books for that reason. I think that's 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 me for now, for the moment. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. It's it's nice to hear from someone who met him, you know, personally. Um, all right, uh, we will move on to Auden, who will be our next speaker. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I decided uh, uh, for this meeting to uh, share with you some thoughts I had about uh, a novel that I have been uh, rereading uh, just recently, which is um, <clears throat> Magic Numbers, Margeshevsky uh, Chisla, which is uh, sort of uh, especially interesting for for a, a Norwegian like myself because the the, the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen plays a, a, a role in part in in that novel. Anyway, every work of literature has an intrinsic system of values. Mostly, there will usually be some elements that represent good and some that represent bad. In later post-Soviet novels, the last uh, shaman, uh, that is Chukchi Bible and the Wandering so Anna Adintseva, the symbolic value of the shaman is rather unambiguous. The shaman represents Chukchi culture, memory, and the tragic loss of vital elements of an indigenous culture. When the last shaman dies, a collective memory is lost. A culture dies with him. Magic Numbers is different. This novel was published in 1986. At this transitional point in time, we are still in the Soviet Union, but we are at the very eve of Glasnost. When writing the novel, Riteo has probably sensed the changes in the air. As compared to later novels, the system of values in Magic Numbers seems less clear-cut certainly as far as the symbolic value of the shaman is concerned. This is a, a work written during Soviet times, and an important difference from later works is that this is still a Soviet novel. Uh, it is modern rather than postmodern, as I see it, because it is a novel that still believes in progress as something both historically necessary and undeniably good. Thus, it does have a different system of values than the later works I have mentioned. The main positive character is a shaman. This is interesting because in the Soviet system of values, the shaman, much like the orthodox priest really, is a negative figure. He stands in the way of progress and so forth. But there is also a really bad shaman in the work, a character called Paul. The main person, Kag, uh, Kagot, is struggling with his own identity as a shaman. He does not forsake his traditional Shukshi beliefs in the spiritual world and so forth, but he seems to want to move on from the archaic cruelties of its practice, as they are portrayed in this book anyway. He begins to doubt his own shamanic powers when he finds himself unable to save the life of his beloved wife, Val. He realizes that shamanic powers as such are restricted. And he then, he then takes his little daughter, Anana, with him and runs away from Ingaluk, the Chukchi, uh, and Inuit village that has been his home up to now. The action of this novel is set on the coast of the Chukotka in 19 and 1920. Just outside the little hunter village that Pagot has fled to, strange newcomers have appeared. They are Norwegians. The moored, a ship belonging to the Norwegian explorer and conqueror of the South Pole, Roald Amundsen. This expedition, the moored expedition, is a historical fact. Amundsen did set out to sail through the Northeast Passage, and then his plan was to drift with the sea, a current across the North Pole. The Maud was locked in the ice outside the Chukotka for more than a year. The Maud is like a world to itself, an isolated island of modernity and a desolate wilderness. The Maud is an utopia in the ice. 
Why is a mold like a utopia? Well, the author is stressing the point that aboard the mold, everything is clean and tidy. <clears throat> Uh, there are no conflicts. Captain Amundsen himself is a good and wise father figure. He does not seem to have any negative traits at all. We never see him being unfair to any member of the crew. This Amundsen, as I have said elsewhere, is reminiscent of the positive hero of socialist realism. The Norwegian explorers all seem to be good, they are also, but they also seem to lack any human traits at all. They are like demi gods or indeed citizens of utopia. There is not a hint of the real historical arms in idiosyncrasies. Our hero Kagot gets a job as a cook aboard the Maud. Uh, there was a real uh, Kagot or Kagot, a young Chukchi man who was hired by Amundsen as a kitchen boy and a general helping hand, and whose daughter Kakonita was adopted by Amundsen. But the real Kagot was clearly not a shaman. Significantly, the author has changed his name from Kakot to Kagot, indicating that they are not the same. In the novel, Amundsen and his crew conceives of Kagot as a gifted fellow. They want to teach him how to read and to write. However, as it turns out, Kagot is much more interested in numbers. Sundbeck, a crew member, becomes his teacher. At this point, it should be noted that in the Chukchi world, there were probably no large numbers of anything important at any time. Sverdrup, a member of Amundsen's crew who made the journey into the Chukotka, observed that they don't count, in the sense that they don't count the number of anything. That was inaccurate, but uh, the Chukchi counted only in, in 20s or in scores the number corresponding to the number of toes and fingers on a human being. The way Eritreori describes this, they do typically have no concept of a number as abstract. Bogorá says the Chukchi indeed have a definite largest number, that is 20 scores, 20 times 20, 400. Pagot, however, intu intuitively understands that the European system of abstract numbers is a magic more powerful than his shamanic powers ever were. Numbers as such, therefore, become a symbol of European, civil European civilization, technology, science, medicine, and so forth. Pagot is given a notebook into which he starts to just write an ever-increasing succession of numbers from one to a thousand, to a thousand and one, and then further. He becomes so absorbed with his numbers that he fails to do his duties as to fulfill his duties as a cook. He causes a dangerous situation with a fire in the kitchen and he seems on his way to losing his mind. In the end, he is given the choice of either giving up his quest for the ultimate magic number or leaving the ship. He chooses the latter. However, when a bad shaman, from Ta, uh, shaman uh, called Tarp from Cargot's native Ingalu comes to either bring Cargot home to continue his calling as a shaman, or if Cargot does not comply, to kill him, Cargot is able to frighten the bad shaman by just showing him the book of his numbers. Tarp believes Cargot's numbers to be a magic stronger than his own, which in a way it is. <clears throat> it could also be argued that Cargot's quest for the ultimate number is utopian by nature, and therefore an echo of the utopia that is represented by the ship itself. Ashore, another modernity, or perhaps other utopians have arrived, the Bolsheviks. They hoist a red flag over the village. One teacher, Alexei Pershin, remains in the village while his comrade leaves and goes further inland. The Bolsheviks' first task is to eradicate illiteracy. Pershing starts teaching the women and children Russian and Russian written language. Thus, the Soviet theme is introduced in the novel, and it becomes very palpable when Pershing makes everybody celebrate May Day and even invites Amundsen and his crew to take part. Um, <clears throat> Pershing is respectful to Chukchi culture. He learns Chukchi language and marries Enkineu, a, a, a Chukchi girl. He is a Russian and a Bolshevik, but he's not a chauvinist. He's not a racist. 
Yet it does become confused and bewildered when having indicated um, that shamans are bad. Um, Kargot simply informs him, well, I am a shaman. This is a direct contradiction of Bolshevik ideology, where the shaman is an evil parasite who sucks the blood of the people. Nevertheless, now he has seen for, for himself that Kargot, the Chukchi shaman, does all the work that the other men of the community do. His role as a shaman is something that comes in addition. In the end, or late in the novel, the ice breaks and the mold can say away. Hilda Amundsen is Kargot's daughter, Ainana, who is now called Mary. Kargot has chosen to rename her in order to fool the spirits that the evil shaman Tarp has sent to harm her. An important theme of this novel is the clash between cultures, the indigenous and the European, the primordial and the modern. It is both a clash and a peaceful meeting, so to speak, on different levels. The peaceful encounters between cultures take place on the outside level. There are no conflicts between the Bolsheviks and the Chukchi, likewise no conflict between the Chukchi and the Norwegians aboard the mall. There is certainly a conflict between Kargot and his shame colleague Tarp, but the real clash is on another level. It takes place inside Kargot himself. As a shaman, Kargot represents the Chukchi past, Chukchi culture, which in the Soviet context is also something okay, cruel, dark, something to move on and away from. This idea of the shaman is also present in the novel, but is represented more mostly by the vindictive top rather than by Kargot. In Magic Numbers, as in later works, the author does convey the idea that because of his unique knowledge, the shaman is an indispensable carrier of the uh, Chukchi culture, a culture that has been formed by the harsh, icy, frigid landscape of the Chukotka. Even in Kargot's ritual killing of his mentor Amos, there is a kind of hard poetry. The ancient ritual is formed by an unforgiving climate and a harsh landscape. It is a sublime moment when Amos' soul leaves his tent in the form of a bird. On the other hand, Kargot himself feels the ritual is cruel and unnecessary. As we have seen, Kargot comes to doubt his shamanic powers. He proves unable to save the life of his beloved wife. <clears throat> he discovers shamanic powers are limited. But on the other hand, we also see how Kargot, at one instance, does succeed in saving the life uh, of his friend Amtin. At this in, uh, point, he's not using magic shamanic powers, but rather, perhaps intuitively, first aid when his friend Amtin has drowned. He gets the water out of Amtin's lungs and starts heart compression, and Amtin lives. Or is this too a part of the shaman's art, uh, the more practical side of it, that uh, Ritiao is writing about elsewhere? Amtin is thus revived and saved, but now it is necessary to give him a new name. Argo chooses Amos, the name of his mentor, again in order to fool the spirits who will now be angry because Kargot is, by saving Amtin, he has not respected their decision to let Amtin die that day. <clears throat> Doubting his uh, shaman's powers, we have seen that Kargot embraces modern European culture represented by the numbers he is writing down in his notebook. Symbolic is also his first sauna bath, as a result of which he loses his old rough Chukchi skin and comes out like a newborn babe. Yet his transition from the primordial uh, shaman to a modern European man is problematic, tragic, and ultimately a failure. For one thing, he keeps his Chukchi world view and beliefs, but in learning numbers, he does not in any way come to master arithmetic. Kargot cannot function as a modern man does, almost losing his mind in a quest for a magic number that all Europeans know cannot exist. He fails. <clears throat> Having failed, Kargot tries to return to a traditional Chukchi lifestyle, 
It seems he succeeds too, but his time is up. The spirits call him home. He dies tragically while trying to find and save the life of a friend leaving for Kalyana, a widow, for the second time. There are more interesting themes in magic numbers. For instance, the shaman as a poet. But uh, for now, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Auden. And our final speaker is Russell Valentino. Um, thank you. Those were both really interesting, made me think a whole bunch of different things, and I hope we get a chance to talk about some of them. Um, uh, I want to just say a couple of things about um, my attraction to Ritke's work and then um, kind of map out a little trajectory, which is the way I usually try to figure out an author's work. Um, so first of all, attraction, uh, I, I really love the the mixture and the 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 um the principle of mixture that seems to uh, animate <clears throat> so much of his work. In this case, it's a it's mixture of I suppose oral tradition and then more Western inspired <clears throat> notions of fiction and and narrative. Um, and uh, yeah, I, putting that together with the notion of trajectory, the fact that he was educated as a writer in in a Russian, in a Soviet uh, context, in, in Soviet university. So he learned to write and to read uh, in, in a particular way, um, which was not necessarily the way that he grew up. And so that, that already uh, brings a kind of an interesting mixture into play, how, you, how he um, negotiates those two things and, and merges them in a way, particularly in his later work. I think in his earlier work, he, he doesn't so much. Um, another uh, thing that I really like a lot is the, the troubling of literary history. <laughs> he, he makes all sorts of problems for literary history and particularly for the stability of our, our thoughts about the stability of texts. Uh, his texts are very, his source texts are really unstable. There is a book by uh, Karen Emmerich a few years old now called Translation and the Making of Originals. And this, and and, Rit, and she, she uses all sorts of case studies in this book. A lot of them are from her, her, her knowledge base. So, you know, Greek, Greek and, uh, and European uh, examples. Rit Hale would be a great example for that book. Um, looking at the the way that the translations then help us to think about what the source in fact is um and what i have in mind is that so her basic her basic claim is that you don't really know that you're talking about an an original a singular original until you have a translation right and and if and textual historians know this very well as soon as you start and make that point it seems kind of banal you look into the history of a text and there's all sorts of variation at the at the beginnings of that text what is war and peace well it's this and that and this other thing and these different editions and these it's got a whole bunch of different stuff and saying there is just one is a little bit naive but we do it all the time when we talk about translation as soon as you say the translation you say the original it's a singular and there wasn't one most of the time, it's the same as all these other things. It's a whole bunch of different texts that make it into this one finalized version that gets published uh, and is the one that usually it's the one that the translator uses. So this troubling of literary history is another really interesting aspect of his work. And I'd like to hear, I know a lot, I, I've because I've taught A Dream in Polar Fog several times, Ilona, I love your translation, by the way, the students love it too. I've taught it several times. So I know the literary history for that one. And I, I can say a couple more things about that. But the the other one, um, the other two are less clear to me. Um, the second one originally published, the Chukchi Bible, originally published, I think, um, Odin, you mentioned it, originally published under a German title in Switzerland. That was the <laughs> first that was the first publication of that book. And that means there was no original source text in Russian, published at least, when that one came out. So I'm guessing, Ilona, that you used a manuscript in Russian. Now, maybe you can talk about that. It's, it wasn't a published version of the Russian text. It was a manuscript. I, I'd like to hear more about it. Uh, and that 
but that's also a, a, a there's a change here. There's something that changed in the interim. He was the first one was published this uh, Dream in Polar Fog, nineteen sixty eight. That's a Soviet book, right? Nineteen sixty eight is a Soviet book, which means it's probably also a socialist realist book. Hmm. And so, if you start thinking about it from the standpoint of socialist realism, how do you read the book? When it's translated and brought into English, it's brought into English in a very different way. It's not a socialist realist book anymore. It's something very different. And that di divergence I find really fascinating and I find it, it, it reduces over time. It's almost as if the context and the readership are completely divorced for, these, for this early book. But by the time you get to the Wales book that you just translated, they're almost the same. The context and the readership, the context of the writing, I mean, and the readership are now they're they've come really close together. That's the trajectory I'm thinking of. Um, in between is a period when the Soviet Union stops. He stops being a Soviet writer. He goes on the market. He doesn't do well on the market. I mean, you, uh, why is that surprising? Name your favorite Native American writer. Right, you're you're doing it, Natasha. I know. <laughs> I saw your lips. Right, there are some. There are certainly plenty. But when they go on the market, they suffer. And so he was a featured Soviet writer, and he went to just another writer. <laughs> many many writers on the market, and he didn't find his audience until he moved to a, an audience abroad, and then he started finding an audience, and that audience was. Uh, a different a different context from the socialist realist one um and then the other thing that i really like and um and that is the the mixing of timescapes and maybe uh Auden can say more about this but the the mythological time that he attempts to merge with what we would think of as realist <laughs> is in that Bakhtin sense of realist literature uh yeah is those are in some ways they're clashing um i mean he's kind of trying to put back realist time into mythological time and that implies different things for the individual the range of activity the range of uh, ethical choices the range of possibilities for individuals uh, maybe everything does become a kind of simple practical thing in the way that ilona was talking about um so this um this bifurcation or the, the 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 split that I'm I'm thinking about on the one hand is the Soviet context, which is socialist realism, and being an acceptable Marxist-Leninist style author, ideologically acceptable, and then on the other being received as an indigenous writer almost entirely after the fall of the USSR, outside of the USSR, um, and that that makes his reception and his and as I put it, the context of the creation of the works really productive and interesting uh, to talk about and to think about. Um, this all, of course, you know, ties into the, the way that Marx books are marketed. Uh, they're usually marketed in the West on, on the basis of the authorial image, which is hard for translators to deal with. Sometimes we were talking before the, before we started about putting the translator's name on the cover of books. Um, well, if you're if you're marketing the book on the author's image and you put this other person's name on the cover, some people look at that and say, "Well, you know, what are, what are readers going to do with that? There's this interloper in the way. What's that person in the way there? I don't know who that is. It's, it's a person who has control over the text somehow. Uh, but in this case, he finds an audience and does this sort of thing that uh, uh, publishers have been really poor at over time, which is timing. <laughs> uh, his timing turns out to, I mean, it's not in his control because he didn't have control over the Soviet Union falling or anything like that. And he, he looks for an audience and happens to find one at exactly the right time. The, the, and I, as I put it, the, as I say, the publishing industry is notoriously bad at this. Books that do really well often do well by chance, it's, they happened to come out at the right time, as opposed to movies. You know, movies they do a lot of demographic research. You also I found in fast. Hello, somebody. Yeah. And uh, I, I can, I can stop there. This, so the, 
the 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 main the main uh, point that I wanted to bring up was this convergence of the two and a kind of success story that is a question of timing when his when the 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 context of his work ends up sort of matching up by the time that the uh, the la the whales are leaving um by the time that happens with um the readership and the expectations of a, of a readership that has been cultivated in in um by western publishers thank you so much russell and thank you to all three of you for sharing your thoughts um we do have some time for questions but russell you threw out two that i thought maybe we could start with because i was also curious to hear ilona your um, maybe a little bit more about the source texts you were working with at various points, and then for the the merging of timescapes, the realist time and the mythological time, if that's something you've paid attention to. I thought those were great questions to start with, and then we can open it up um, to anyone else's questions. Um, well, uh, Russell is correct. I don't exactly know the story of... of um, the Chukchi Bible, but I do know that the manuscript that I worked on was typed up. It wasn't it wasn't handwritten, but it wasn't um you know it wasn't a PDF. It wasn't page set. It was a mimeographed, a photographed sheets that someone had to scan in Switzerland, um because it didn't exist on the internet. It didn't exist as a text file. Um, a lot of his books went out of print and are actually really quite difficult to find. I think actually even a dream in polar fog. Um, I was working from uh, copied on a copier, separate pages of a book because Unions Verlag had one book in their possession and they had to photocopy it page by page and send it to me physically. You know, it was very, very low tech. And then a dream and, uh, and then a Chukchi Bible was um, types. It was not exactly typeset. I don't think it was a book in Russian to begin with. Um, of course, the funny thing is when Roman Abramovich, the Russian oligarch, you know, who bought up half of Chukotka, became mayor of Chukotka, he republished all of Yuri's works. But it was a blip because as soon as he stopped being governors, you know, the works all went out of print again. And by the time uh, when the Wales leave was written, Yuri was sort of back in vogue again, but in a way more in the West, I think, than in in Russia. It's worth It's worth remembering that in the Soviet Union, he was if we're really brutal about it, he was a sort of pet minority author. He was allowed to travel. He met Farley Moat in America. He was kind of like the representative of how nice the Soviet Union was in letting indigenous authors do their thing. Um, so he really benefited from being in the fold. And as Russell said, you can see the books from the 60s, 70s, 80s, you can see a kind of progression of him maybe not exactly writing to order, but writing with an eye to what was expected. And in, and in some of the books, there are these little didactic sort of almost insertions where he does a little vignette and you just think, why is this here? And it's there because then it could be taught in schools because then he could point to it and say, well, look, you know, I'm showing. And then even if you look at the Chukchi Bible, you know, the American, the, the arrival of the, of the Soviet powers is very, is, is very equivocal and what they bring is very equivocal. And Yuri in my conversations with him was never, he never subscribed to the kind of, you know, it's noble not to have indoor plumbing and we should have been left alone to eat walrus kind of thing. He was very happy with plumbing and alphabet and train travel and all these things. He was very unsentimental about uh, this really harsh way of life that had been improved. But at the same time, you can see in the work as the time goes on that he stops doing this this Soviet realism. He stops putting in these little vignettes about, you know, and here's what you should think about how history happened. And it's really interesting to see. And the thing about time, which Russell, you made me think of, was I have this idea from either a conversation I had with him or I can't remember how it went in my head, this idea of, in his books, of time being a spiral and not a loop you know, in the rings of the past and the future and, and the present, they sort of touch each other. Children are named for their ancestors. It's all very close. And yet in When the Whales Leave, you have this woman, the kind of progenitress now, who lives seemingly, you know, for centuries, for thousands of years, for all we know. And the thing that causes this, the rupture of this Eden in the end is that the people she lives with, her tribe, 
they become progressively more and more wigged out by this idea of a person who ages but doesn't die this person who claims to be a real relic of the beginning of the world a real relic of the beginning of human time um and whether or not these successive generations believe her the fact of her presence is there everyone's great granddad can remember that she was old when they were you know a little boy and towards the end of the book this really very fundamentally frightens the kind of antagonist uh, in a way that I think nothing else in the book does. And the whole central conflict that causes this kind of Eden to fall is this absolute terror on the part of the latter generations that they are connected to the past in this very, very bold, very unsubtle way. There's a person among them who is the past. It drives it drives the antagonist absolutely kind of loopy with terror. It's and I think that's really the thing. It's a thesis for a science fiction novel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a way. And it's and it's what's really interesting is that she doesn't make any claims to being divine. She doesn't have superpowers, you know. No one can say that she's but it's her insistence that she has been there since the beginning of human time and her refusal to die that in the end sort of uh, it, it's it's a kind of you know it's a hyper object that the tribe just they can't they can't they can't approach it they 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 shy away from it and in the end it causes a massive conflict that she is this very physical manifestation of deep time that lives with them and it's just there you know um, she doesn't tell them what to do she doesn't you know, she's just there and it, and it drives them and it drives the antagonist sort of mad and I find that really visceral actually in the book really really interesting Auden, do you have anything you would like to add about either time within the novels or, you know, the realist and mythological time coming together? And, and you're muted, I'll, I'll note, so. Uh, Auden, you're still muted. Thank you. Yes, well, um... Uh, obviously, this uh, merging of, of mythological and uh, and the realistic time is is uh, very interesting uh, because uh, usually we think of mythological time as um, as something um, uh, it's an absolute past. You know, it's uh, it's it's just no connection with uh, with the now. Uh, at all, but uh, uh, actually, when you when you come to think about it, uh, this uh, beginning of uh, that that you see in the in, in the when the whales leave uh, is is a the, it depicts uh, the the absolute past of uh, of the coastal Turkey, but in in actual fact they. Uh, Started to uh, to hunt uh, uh, marine mammals as late as the 17th century, so it's uh, it's not like they have been doing that for for thousands of years. It's uh, the, the absolute past uh, in in a people that has a mythological past. It doesn't have to be that long ago, really. Uh, so. Um, so, so that I find uh, I found uh, quite fascinating. But then, on the other hand, uh, there are also some stories uh, that we have in, in Chukchi Bible, for instance, that necessarily must be extremely old. For instance, uh, uh, the idea of the raven being the creator of the world, which is which is the same story that you find, uh, uh, for instance, among the Haida of, of British Columbia. There are some a few differences, but. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it was a great revelation to me. I went uh, some years ago to um, uh, the Ethnographical Museum of uh, Vancouver, and I saw this great raven that uh, that is um, wooden raven that is actually depicted on a Canadian five dollar bill. I think, but it's the same. It's it's, it's the same uh, same story. So how many thousands of years uh, is that legend? The raven crazing the world is. It's, it's, it's really, really fascinating. Um, so, um, 
uh, yes, that, so, so that's uh, uh, I think uh, when the whales leave is kind of one extreme. Uh, it is the the myth the, the mythological time, especially at the beginning of the, of the book, is, is dominating. Whereas the, the the novel that I talked about today um, is is the absolute um, uh, counterpart to that because it's put in a historical time and space. It, well, it's uh, when it comes to space, everything is taking place as Alona talked about at this uh, place called ULN, which is uh, this extreme point in the ge geographical point, of course. Uh, but um, but what is so special about 1919 and, and 1920 is that this ship, the uh, Norwegian ship, the Maud, is locked in the ice at that exact point. And uh, now that's the action is, is pinpointed in time, not only because of the ship, but also uh, because this is a very special historical period. Kind of in the background of this novel, we find out there is a civil war going on and uh, and the old Russian uh, imperial, uh, empire is uh, is falling and uh, and suddenly we have these people called Bolsheviks who are who are making their entrance entrance at uh, at the end of the novel. So um, so yes, indeed, in, in Hill's work we find several kinds of time, several very different chronotypes, and sometimes we find them in uh, in the same work as we indeed do in in uh, Bible. Can I just add that the the that the to, to me the one that merges the most is Chukchi Bible. The 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 yeah. dream and oh. frog is pretty also straightforward. It's like uh, magical numbers. It's very straightforward historical fiction. Uh, maybe I don't know. Maybe adventure fiction even. And then uh, uh, where the whales when the whales leave has a lot more mythology. It's it's a uh, it's a lot more lyric in that sense. But in the middle, this is Chukchi Bible book which starts off with origin stories and ends up with the birth of the main character, it becomes a kind of building almost. Yeah. And so he merges, it's very clearly- uh, It uh, ends with the birth of the author. That's right, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's, uh, it, it is a kind of Bildungsroman uh, in, in the making. The, the, uh, the thing I wanted to say about the history that, and why I see such a stark difference here uh, it, it is, the fact that the A Dream in Polar Fog, this 1968 book, was the first half of a duology. And when, and I, when I went to the library looking for Ritheo, I found the second half. And the second mm -hmm. book is very clearly uh, ab about sending a representative from the Chukchi tribe, which is this now elected John McClellan f figure who was the main character in that book, to serve in the Supreme so Soviet. And so it it it's it's got this sort of build up to now political inclusion, and it has those cat classic, uh, versus Sosnotsonist categories, right? Uh, elemental spontaneity, which is the tribe, versus consci political consciousness, and so it's a coming to political consciousness, which is sending somebody to the Supreme Soviet, who then becomes a representative for the tribe. So it's a pretty straightforward, uh, socialist realism. In that in that regard, yeah. Well, uh, if you ever wondered why the Dream and Polar Fog ends on such a kind of random, not quite cliffhanger, it's because it's part one. Yeah. yeah. I see. Uh, officially, we have three minutes left, but I think everyone might be willing to stay a tiny bit longer for questions from the audience. If uh, I, I see, well. Um... If, uh, there are two things uh, I wanted to say about the uh, Chukchi Bible, um, uh, about the practicality and also about uh, modern times, the fact that Metkin, when he by uh, chance ends up in, in San Francisco, he, well, he is a shaman from the Chukotka, but he thinks of himself as a health worker who seeks work in, in a hospital and for the money that he, he earns, he buys a set of surgical uh, instruments and a barometer because uh, a shaman is also a metrologist. <laughs> and, and, and then he, he returns to, uh, to the Dakota and kills a man who has uh, 
his rival in a duo. So it's it, it's really this yeah. uh, uh, this archaic cruel meets the modern and and, and so forth. And, uh, and and of course also the 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 the, the World Fair was called that uh, at Chicago, which uh, uh, raises the the the, the racist uh, question that we haven't talked about, but which is uh, also a very interesting point with Litkeo, who was according. I haven't talked to Litkeo himself because when I started to work with uh, Litkeo, that was two thousand and eight, and I I didn't want to bother him because he was very ill at the time. Uh, but I have talked to, to his son, and his son said that Litkeo was. Uh, I, I I asked him whether he was feeling pressure uh, from the uh, from the authorities, and he said no, by no means. On bull ablask and lastiani. So they they really he was a pet like you know so, and and I saw a lot of uh, the stuff that uh, his son Alexander had in his uh, in his apartment is uh, seals and stuff from Africa because Litkeo had been to Ethiopia and he had met Haile Selassie the emperor and he had also been to the Philippines <laughs> and met uh, uh, Thurman Marcos the strong man there so uh, so, so um, uh, Yes, but I don't have time to, to say anything conclusive about it, but a fascinating figure, I must say. <clears throat> Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? I think we have time for two or three. Um, you can raise your hand or type it in the chat. If you want to speak, um, we will unmute you. I have a question if no one wants to jump in. Looks like Natasha has a question. Oh, I can un unmute myself. I just discovered. Um, yeah, I have two short questions. Uh, the first one is about Ritheo's later works and the uh, this paradigm of Bildungsroman that, that is definitely present in his late Soviet period. If I'm not familiar with his later works, but I was just wondering if this if this pattern is preserved in his later novels and and, and shorter pieces. Uh, is, do you do you see a shift? Does this exchange of knowledge become um, mutual between the indigenous people and the alien newcomers? Does does it ever? shift or or does the indigenous subject remain someone to be educated this is my first question and the second question is about scholarship um studying the work of indigenous writers writing in russian is there would you say that there is a field of scholarship or is it in emergence are there scholars studying their works as works of indigenous writers not not as works of Soviet Russian Russian authors. Thank you. I can try with the uh, uh, Bildungsroman question. Uh, uh, at least with the Chukchi Bible, I would say he's still operating in a similar sort of narrative framework, though he he does it in a different way. He starts with mythological time and origin stories and then works his way towards his as was pointed out earlier his own birth right so he's kind of laying the foundation for um for it's like the pre a pre buildings from on it's really getting ready for buildings from on um and then the other question about uh what he's i i think he's actually the the passing on of knowledge the the way this is my interpretation and you others can tell me that, that if they disagree but i think it ends with him <laughs> and i think it ends with him because he is doing something fundamentally different from what hmm. the shaman did shaman passed on knowledge to the next person in the same form the stories told in a particular way rituals done in a particular way he's taking 
a whole bunch of stuff and creating a literary tradition on on that basis. And that's a Western paradigm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's something that is passed on from one person to another. It's a Western paradigm for consumption by a b much bigger audience. That, that's my impression. Ilona, you have something to say. Well, you've reminded me of something that happens in um, the book of reportage I mentioned. There's, a, there's an essay there about the, um, the, the Ganasan people um, who are at the extreme east of Russia. And in it, there appears a song, a kind of very ancient song. And um, we had a moment where my code translator, we were going over the text, we were translating separately. And then looking at each other's text, she said, you know, it's very opaque, this song. Do you think it's too sort of, do you think it's too opaque? It's quite hard to parse what's happening in it. Should we make it more, you know, do you want to have a look at it again and just add more information and then sort of change it? And I thought about it and thought about it. And I realized because of my experience with Rakao and the songs that appear in his books, that a song in this tradition, it's passing on a lot of the information that the tribe already knows. It's shorthand. We all know the story of the Goldilocks and the three bears. You don't need the detail, you know what it is. We all know the story of Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf. So hmm. my answer to that was sort of, no, we keep it opaque because the song is not intended for really in, in the way that it's who it's sung to and how we're presenting it. It's not intended for an audience of people who don't already know the story. And the Rukheo, of course, takes this oral tradition, this shorthand of myths that everyone knows, things that everyone knows, and explains it and expands it and writes it in a way that he was taught to write, you know, at Moscow University. And so he's doing something fundamentally different for a much bigger audience, exactly, exactly as Russell said. And it's a really big departure. Um, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, um, Ritchow is, is not only doing something completely different. He's, uh, he's a sort of, uh, well, when we think about the shaman, a shaman, uh, a special gift that the shaman has is uh, the power to transform. And often, uh, young Chukchi and other Arctic people were chosen if they have demonstrated in some way um, a, a power to transform. This, this could sometimes be a, a transsexual, for instance, but it could be also other kinds of, of transformation. But I think. The, uh, the ultimate transformation is actually Ritchel himself, who uh, is uh, born into a, um, a society that, where, that is Neolithic, uh, really. And he becomes a Russian writer. Uh, he, he masters the Russian language and he masters the, the trade of, of writers. And um, so uh, by becoming a, a Russian writer, he's also... Uh, a, a shaman <laughs> because he has demonstrated his ability to transform and uh, I also uh, as an echo of that find uh, interesting uh, the echo of uh, this this idea that uh, the poet and the shaman uh, that there is a link between uh, uh, those two because in uh, for instance this novel uh, that I have read now there are a, a lot of poetry. Uh, those are really the the thoughts of uh, the thoughts of Kagot that they are they are also poem. So uh, I, I I have a feeling that uh, to, to me anyway that Ritchell uh, uh, is in a way uh, true to his old roots uh, from a shaman's family by becoming transforming as it were into an author, a Russian author. It okay. was uh, the opposite of Adin, uh, Anna Adinsova, who was uh, uh, a, a Russian ethnog ethnographer who becomes a shame. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think Ani had a question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very sad to report I have never read Ritchel, so I have some homework to do. Um, my question is kind of listening to uh, the presenters and kind of um, trying to understand his um, 
cultural identity and literary identity, I was kind of thinking a little bit, uh, some bells were wrong with Chinggis Aitmatov, and I was kind of wondering, so um, what was his, um, what was Ritkeo's um, um, literary or intellectual um, network like? If there is, if, if there is anyone who can provide information on that, that would be wonderful and helpful. Thank you. Well, he well, well, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Alden. Alden, go ahead. Well, just to uh, say that he, uh, Ritzko and uh, and Akhmatov, uh, were friends, and uh, and it was, uh, if I remember rightly, it was uh, Akhmatov who introduced him to to Julian Leitus, the uh, the Swiss. Uh, publisher that uh, uh, that start to publish his books, and I was going to take the other end of the spectrum. He became a member of the Writers uh, Union of the USSR in 1954 at the age of 24. So he was a young guy, and hmm. uh, was a member of the establishment for many years. So his network was the Writers Union for a while, hmm. at least, and at least until the end of the Soviet Union. Anyone else? I, yeah, I, I find it absolutely fascinating that he moved to St. Petersburg in 19, like 1946. It was Leningrad, 1946, 1947. It, just, it was just after the war and yeah. was there in Stalin's last years. That's when he was going to school. So, you know, that had to have affected him, the way that he approached writing thinking about writing intellectuals being an intelligent in that context it had to have, it had to have affected him pretty profoundly that at that young age and his wife was a blockadnitsa she had uh, uh, survived the uh, the siege of leningrad um i thought i would take advantage of having two practicing translators um is it is it am i right that that rikeu also translated himself um was it like Pushkin and Tolstoy a little bit? Is that right? I into, think so, yeah. Into Chukchi, yeah, I think that's right. He was translating works back into Chukchi. I mean, so I guess it would be hard for us to evaluate his own uh, practice as a translator, but I am wondering whether, I mean, we're talking so much about translation. He was obviously interested in it, and he's translating these oral myths into Western paradigms like you have been talked about. In the In the novels, do any of you see a self-consciousness about translation issues or transmission issues um, that come up? Or an awareness of impediments, I suppose. The, so, the realism novels feel like certainly Polar Fog, much more kind of ethnographic. There's a lot of, there's a lot of footnotes. There's a lot of this word means this, and this is what we call this. It's, just, it's didactic. And I think as he goes on, there's less, there's less ethnic, you know, flavor, okay. in a way, almost like the people who are consuming it are not, are not, are not reading it as a textbook because we all live in the Soviet Union and we all love, you know, all the nationalities that live there. Let's learn about them. You know, there's a real sense of kind of moving on from that. Um, by the time you get to the later books, and it's less sort of ethnographic primer about Chukotka and the kind of people that live there, and more sort of concerned with you know time and space and literature and myth and all of this other stuff and he gives up on the explanations largely of what means what and just lets the reader read for themselves um i i slightly quaver when i see the number of footnotes um in a dream and polar fog now and i think to my and i say to myself no they should be there because that's that's how the book is intended also to be read whereas when the whales leave we knew from the beginning that that was not going to have you know, that we're going to have very little explanatory bits added in, you know, um, as translators do, and it was going to have no footnotes and no vocabulary in italics as much as we could help it, you know. So, so yeah, there's definitely, over time, he becomes freer, I think, in what he does. I, I don't think there are more footnotes than in uh, uh, 
I don't know, prisoner of the Caucasus, <laughs> you know, about Caucasian language use, you know, Tolstoy mm -hmm. throws in all those footnotes about, you know, this is a blank and that's a blank. As, and and the, the addition, the, the printer, the publisher did a fantastic job of, of, of putting it in half tone. It's, it was a beautiful, really the really first beautiful. printing, whoever has the hardback of A Dream in Polar Fog, it was printed in a press in Vermont on beautiful paper. It's as a publisher, I know it's so expensive. You really have a very expensive item in your hand. Um, you know, books very, very rarely get printed like this. Thank you to the archipelago who did such a gorgeous uh, job with it. Um, it no other books by Yuri Kao in English are like that stunning. And very Captain. few archipelago books have a hardbound. I mean, they're they're almost yeah. all paper. Some, I mean, well, they nice... were they were young and ambitious, and yeah. you know, before the bills started coming in. Um, to answer your question, uh, Lizzie, I don't see any self consciousness about translation per se. In the first book, in the, in this dream, pull of fog, he, he, there is a a, a a character who's learning the language, and sometimes they do translate for him, and he translates thing. He they have to translate individual words usually but it's it goes away after a while as the footnotes do they get fewer and fewer as the mm -hmm. book goes on because presumably he's he's learning uh, and he knows he knows the language and there's a there's always a self-consciousness about storytelling uh mm, he's, yeah. he's paying attention to how the stories are told but I'm not sure about, I don't see it in translation, I, but I wasn't reading it with that in mind at the time. So I, there could be more there that I'm just not remembering. Yeah. Do you know, I've worked several times now with authors who are alive and speak English reasonably well. And it can be quite complicated if you're in touch with the author and the author is, you know, you, you sort of, um, and he was really remarkably unfussy about everything, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not even, I, I'm, I, you know, I say I don't know if he read the he read enough of the translation. I think, but I had the sense that he read you know the first few chapters. Like, yeah, this is fine. You're fine. It's good. It's fine. Let's sell this book and make money. He was very. He was like not the person that goes through your text and goes, oh, but what I meant here was this, and oh, what do you think of this word that I like? Can you put this in? Really, mm -hmm. I I worried a little bit, and there was nothing to, there was nothing, nothing, nothing to worry about. He wouldn't be drawn in, in Vegas I tried really hard you know to kind of draw him on whether he liked it um it's, it's you know it's one of these young translator things like did you did you like what did you what did you, when did you what did you you know what did you think what did you think and he kind of evaded all of my all of my questions and at the very end before before we all said goodbye he said it sings in English I'm happy and I thought, okay <laughs> like okay I'm not gonna ask you again like, like we're done I'm happy with that it's fine yeah. Again, they very, did practical, say, uh, very practical kind of writing. They did say somewhere, didn't they, that they liked the English word storyteller because that was his, uh, how he conceived of himself, really. He was a storyteller. And he was very concerned with more than one thing. He was actually quite concerned with rhythm. Um, he said he wrote a lot of the parts of his books as though they could be sung and I think When the Whales Leave is definitely for me that book that could be sung. And at the very beginning, when it's very, very deep time myth and the creation of the world and all this kind of stuff, I I don't know whether it's conscious or unconscious. It was probably conscious towards towards you know later. The book begins almost like with lots of triples, with a kind of biblical rhythm, you know, and then it and then it ends out and becomes more like traditional fiction as you go on. The first, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten pages they're very sort of undulating because because you're reading you know it, it's kind of like the bible it has to it has to flow like a song i was very conscious with that book of him saying years before some of some of the things i write i write them like a song like you could sing it if you wanted to and when the whales leave is definitely that book from from start to finish so please read it it's really good <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I will say, read everything and teach everything. Um, I don't want to cut anyone off, but I'm aware that we're a little over time. So um, I would like to thank REI again for organizing and the panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. This was really wonderful. Give them a virtual Zoom applause. <laughs> <laughs>